a muscle invasive bladder cancer is when it's it's growing kind of deeper roots into that muscle layer of the bladder. We'll go back to the picture in a minute so I can show you exactly. Um, but why is it bad if they say on the pathology report that it has grown into the, into the muscle layer? Um, that's mainly because blood vessels and the, the lymph vessels that drain to the lymph glands run in that muscle layer. So if the cancer cells have invaded into the muscle layer, well, then the potential for it to get into the bloodstream and go beyond the bladder to other organs or lymph nodes nearby, um, that risk is much higher. When it's just superficial, really, it can't get near the blood vessels, are very, very unlikely to, um, but muscle invasive can. So the treatment is subsequently more aggressive for that to try and mop up anything that could have already escaped the bladder. Um, so that on this little picture, and I'll go back to the previous one, is the right-hand side here. So all these ones, you'll see the, the little yellow blobs are starting to grow into that deeper, the deeper layer underneath. Um, and where you can see the little pink dots, which are muscle fibres, in between will be where the blood vessels and everything run. So if it's grown all the way through like this, it could well have actually grown into a blood vessel on the way as well, and then potentially break off and go outside the bladder. Go back to this one. Um, so what's the treatment when it's become muscle invasive? Um, well, the num number one is usually surgery, looking at consideration of removing the bladder and the lymph nodes nearby to basically is a curative kind of thing to try and get rid of where the cancer is and cure you of the cancer altogether. We are more and more starting to use chemotherapy as well. Um, and ideally the best results are if someone has chemotherapy first, so before their surgery. Um, and I think I go on to come talk a bit more about that. Um, but the, the role for the chemo first is obviously trying to shrink the cancer that's in the bladder and make the hopefully make the surgery a little bit easier. But also if some cancer cells have broken off from the cancer and are circulating in the body, then you're mopping them up as early as possible with some chemotherapy first. And the chemo I'm talking about in this situation, though, is giving it intravenously. So coming into a chemo suite, having a drip put in your hand and chemo drugs going into the bloodstream, not just into the bladder. Because if you give the drugs just into the bladder, even though it's growing deeper, as you're really just kind of coating the surface of it and you're not getting to the deeper parts of where the cancer is growing. Um, if obviously someone is not fit for surgery, and that could be because of other health problems like heart problems or lung problems, and they might not be fit enough to safely make it through a big surgery, there might be a combination of chemotherapy and radiation given together um, or radiation alone. So what is the chemo that we use? And as I said, kind of the chemo is thought to be more beneficial prior to surgery, and you might see the word called neoadjuvant, which just means prior to surgery. Um, so these are much more of your traditional chemotherapy that you hear about people having. So, you know, the side effects of being you know, the tiredness and nausea and possibly losing a little bit of hair, that's kind of things that can happen with this chemo. And the goals there, obviously, as I said, was to, to shrink the primary cancer in the bladder, but then also to treat anything that was microscopic. Um, so that's something that's not detectable on a CT scan or a bone scan, but could potentially be floating around in the bloodstream that we can't pick up. Um, and the, the thought with any chemo that's given prior to surgery in lots of different cancers is that it basically allows the treatment to start much sooner. So rather than having to go through surgery and giving any of those little microscopic bits two or three months to grow, you're getting onto it straight away as soon as you've been diagnosed. Also gives us an idea of how the chemo works. So if you have some chemo before surgery and then have your, the bladder removed or a cancer removed and we can see that nearly all the cancer cells are dead, well, then we know those chemotherapy drugs are really, really effective. Whereas if you have the chemo first and at the time of surgery, there's still quite a lot of cancer cells that are alive. It means possibly something was resistant to that chemo. We might need to give something more afterwards or think about other treatments. It's not always possible to give chemo first. So sometimes the, the cancer within the bladder has actually blocked the flow of urine. So on one side, it might be that the ureter, which is the, the tube that drains from the kidney to the bladder, gets blocked, and that we see on the blood, the kidney function tests are not very good. And it, so it might be that it's not safest to give chemo first and might need either a stent put in or might have to have the surgery first.
Um, so what chemo drugs do we use or what we call them kind of chemotherapy protocols, which is what combinations and how are the schedules given? Um, most commonly, it's two drugs together, either cisplatin or carboplatin, and they're very similar, but the cisplatin relies more on the kidney function, so sometimes we can't give it in combination with gemcitabine. Um, or some of you may have heard of a very toxic chemo combination, which we don't use very much because of how hard it is for people to get through it, called MVAC, and that's four chemotherapy drugs given together. And as you can imagine, if people feel crook and run down on two, they feel twice as bad when they have four all at the same time. So that's kind of reserved for the fittest, youngest people that can, we think can get through that. And usually it's given for a maximum of 12 weeks before surgery. So we don't want to delay the surgery for too long. So if you're having lots of side effects from chemo, we need to delay it or change doses. We don't really want to wait more than that kind of 12 weeks before we get on with the surgery. All um, chemo given like this is still as an outpatient, which means you come to a chemo suite on the day or the hospital for the, on the day, have a drip put in the hand, the chemotherapy runs through and then you go home again the same day. So it doesn't require staying in hospital um, unless there's complications or you feel sick afterwards. Obviously that might lead to coming into hospital, but most of the time it's coming into the chemo suite for a couple of hours, having the treatment and going home again the same day. If the chemotherapy is given before surgery, majority of the time there's no need for any further chemo afterwards. Whereas if obviously it can't be given before surgery, we then assess whether someone's fit enough or well enough after their big operation to have it after, chemo, after the surgery. Um, Paddy, maybe you're still gonna talk about the side effects of chemo, mm. but a uh, question came through, keen to understand some potential impacts that intravenous chemo treatments cause down the track. Obviously different chemo combinations mean that no two scenarios may be the same, but can result in further medical conditions, i.e. can make you more prone to developing other cancers or cause long-term issues with other parts of the body. Mm. Um, yes, I guess because it's different for different schedules, I wasn't going through it in detail, but across the board for the two that we use predominantly, the cisplatin and gemcitabine or the carboplatin and gemcitabine, um, there's usually um, biggest side effects would be fatigue, and that tends to build up the more chemo you have. So the first treatment, you might find you're, you're really run down for two or three days, but then bounce back. But by um, the fourth round, you might find that it actually you're pretty tired for the whole three weeks. Um, nausea can certainly happen, but the medications we give to stop nausea and prevent and treat the nausea are pretty good now. So it's really very uncommon for someone to come back and say they vomited, for example, but might be a little bit squirmish for a couple of days after treatment. Uh, can get um, lose your hair a little bit. Usually these drugs only cause some thinning of the hair, so it's not like someone having breast cancer where they lose it all and need to wear a wig or a scarf. It's usually just some thinning of the hair that you can kind of get away without too many people noticing. Um, but kind of the question was also you know, long-term, what can it do? Um, they do, obviously, during the treatment, you have a lowering in your immunity, so risk of infection substantially increased. Um, Chemotherapy does seem to have some effect on blood vessels and heart disease. So that can go up a little bit later. The risk of heart disease definitely goes up. Um, there can be some hearing damage with the cisplatin. So it can cause some ringing, ringing in your ears or some hearing loss. So occasionally, especially in men who have worked in, um, have been a tradie or worked around very noisy um, professions might already have some hearing loss and we might find that that's unmasked by them having the cisplatin that brings on the ringing or the hearing loss really quickly. So that can be worse down the track. Um, the two drugs we commonly use don't really have an increased risk of secondary cancers from those drugs. Um, within the MVAC, the four drugs given together, there's a, there was a slight chance of secondary leukemias from the chemo drugs. Um, but the, the chance of that's obviously extremely low compared to the chance of the, the bladder cancer itself spreading. So there's a weighing all those things up of, we go, look, you know, if we don't have any treatment now, this bladder cancer is going to come back for sure versus, you know, a 1% chance or more, actually less about one in a thousand chance of secondary leukemias from the, the actual treatment. Um, but obviously if someone really sick and get lots of side effects and then out of hospital with infections, you can be quite run down. Um, 
you know, losing muscle and weight and that kind of thing during chemo, although we try to make adjustments to that early on if those things are, are starting to happen. And especially if it's given prior to surgery and there's lots of side effects, we would rather bail on the chemo and get on with the surgery. Um, Judas had mentioned, but I'm not quite sure exactly what she was saying, but she said doxyrubicin was added to the MVAC O-F-L-S-T-A. Oh, and yeah. So doxorubicin is the same as adriamycin. So just to, to keep it simple so that the MVAC made sense, I called it the, the trade name, which is adriamycin, to keep the A right for the MVAC. But, yes, doxorubicin and adriamycin are the same thing. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, good. That's answered some questions for now. There are some prognosis questions coming mm -hmm. up, but I'm sure we, you'll get to that. Now, do you want to finish your talk? and then? Um, no, no, no. I haven't kind of specifically gone into prognosis because oh. of it being so specific depending on how yes. aggressive cancer was in an individual person. So. Well, let's yeah. say, let's say, and I, I mean, I, I hate personally being asked these questions, but because we're not God and obviously we can't say how long people are going to live. I, I yeah. don't think I could have done oncology for that reason because yeah, it's all and, about... Yeah, and that's a... They're only statistics and the numbers don't mean much on a one-on-one -on -one no, basis. Like no, yeah. And you always hear the story of, you know, my doctor told me I had so many years to live, you know, and then I lived an I extra 10. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, but the question was, let's say for the average person in this group who's had straightforward muscle invasive, mm. you know, T2 disease, had a very successful surgery, tumour was taken out, lymph nodes are negative, it, what's the long-term yeah. prognosis? Look, I'd be guessing it probably, you know, maybe about a 15 to 20% chance of something coming back in that kind of situation, especially if there's been a really good response to the chemo and safely got through their surgery. When I've got plenty of people that have all of that done and then we're following them up with their scans for five years and nothing comes back and we don't kind of keep following up yeah. beyond that. Um, but the risk of yeah. it coming back obviously gets higher the more aggressive the cancer was. So if at the time of surgery it was found to be uh, going through the other side of the, the bladder and possibly going in a female near the uterus or a man near the bowel or something, then that, that risk is much, much higher. Um, or if the lymph mm. nodes had cancer within them, of course, then we would be more suspicious that something might come back and probably follow those people up more closely. Yeah. But yeah, the, the prognosis um, is, is very hard and it, it sometimes it's very hard for people to mm. get their head around those numbers because, you know, for one person, either your cancer comes back or it doesn't. It doesn't matter if the stats were 10% or 50%, but it does help us identify or choose who we think is worth going very aggressively and very hard with their treatment versus someone who had an early cancer. We wouldn't want to go through all of this if it changed this outcome by 2%. Yeah. What are the... What are the strengths and weaknesses of viewing a PET scan for bladder cancer? Yeah, I saw that down here. Um, I really quite like PET scans in terms of looking for any spread of bladder cancer, but it's not at all helpful for looking at the bladder and the ureters themselves, really, because the dye that you give is a radioactive sugar and it gets filtered by the kidneys. Um, so what happens on the PET scan is that the kidneys, the ureters and the bladder go black no matter what, so it makes it really hard to actually examine the primary cancer in the bladder, but it is very helpful for seeing if there's anything in the lymph nodes or spread anywhere else in the body. Um, and I, it, they're not funded by Medicare in bladder cancer, so we don't use them all that much, but occasionally someone just says, look, I want to have a PET scan anyway, and they, they pay to have it done, and I find that it can be really useful for picking up really tiny lymph nodes. So um, you people in the chat may or may not know a CT scan is kind of like a black and white picture. It just shows us if something is big or small. It won't show any act what's going on inside something. Um, whereas a PET scan will only show up as these little black marks on the PET scan if there's activity, so if there's growth inside something. So it means even if a lymph node is only five millimetres in size and we normally would have completely ignored it on a CT scan, if it's shown a lot of activity inside on a PET scan, it's much more suspicious of something having spread. So... I think they're helpful. We don't do them all that often only because of the cost of them um, and because it can't assess the, the bladder itself properly. A question relating to CBD oil, which we were chatting mm -hmm. about in our Q&A session last week. Um, does it in, impact on chemotherapy in any way or is it, are people yeah, free to use it? I don't think it? so. Um, I've got a lot of patients who use CBD oil as an alternative to anti-nausea drugs, people that get really bad nausea and find that the Either they have side effects from traditional anti-nausea medications or it's still bad despite that and they use CBD oil. Um, there's not much proof that it has a lot of anti-cancer effects, so I wouldn't kind of recommend it as a cancer treatment. 
Um, but I don't have an issue with people taking it at the same time as their chemo if it's helping with their symptoms otherwise.